Today in the closet, I'm here with Australian textile artist Barbara Whelan and Barbara's uh, doing a three-week artist in residency with the Formery. Welcome to Wellington. Oh, thank you. It's been wonderful. So tell me about your practice here. What are you looking to do in the next three weeks? Okay, um, I came, I've come to Wellington with some ideas in mind to design some garments using the local flowers from the Botanic Gardens. I'm looking specifically at camellias uh, because my experience in, at home in Canberra is that camellias print, um, give a beautiful colour to silk. Um, early experiments here though have indicated that I'm not going to get the same colours on the fabrics that I've brought so I'm in the process of doing some experiments and we'll show you a, little, a few, couple of those in a few minutes. Yeah, so you're, uh, and you're working on a garment while you're here? Yes I am. Um, uh, I've been lucky enough to be supported by the ACT government to come and one of the highlights of my trip apart from working with you and Peter is to uh, go to the World of Wearable Art opening on, in a couple of weeks. And I've made this garment, which comes from workshop waste. I, I make garments uh, with Australian wool. It's a wool knit. It's, it has it's a merino. Merino, yeah. And um, I have some, I haven't developed completely zero waste designs for the wool fabrics. So I end up having these things, which are what's left, the negative space in the, in the, the run of the fabric when you make a garment. And so what I've done is I've rolled them into little um, things and made them into roses to put onto a bolero. And my intention is to dye this with camellias. But early tests with camellias this morning tell me it comes out yellow on wool, not pink. So I'm oh going to no. have to find another pink oh source. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got different, like you've got a wool, a heavier, like blanket wool in here and yeah. different... Um, different colour roses to pick up, to give that variance when you dye it? Yeah, different... well like with any bunch of flowers there's always the difference in diversity and while I was making this in my uh, remnant box I found pieces of silk garment, um, an old piece of wool that I'm pretty sure has nylon in it, it's something that I bought right. commercially rather than from my trusted supplier yeah and then this is um, an old blanket that I've made garments from and this is something that I've dyed using onions so wow what a vivid color yeah it's gold isn't it? so all you're dyeing is from vegetables or botanicals yeah. or natural yeah 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 I established my label every thread counts um, in 2016 with the idea that it would be um, a mode of being able to express my artistic, my, my artist, my arts practice, because I'm a compulsive maker. I'd, I'd like to have an outlet so that I can keep making. And it, I'm very pragmatic. I can't just store things. So the label does that, but it also gives me an opportunity to express my relationship with nature and plants. And so all my garments are designed with waste in mind. So if I can't design it complete the waste out of the process when I make it then I use it in other ways right um, and I print only with botanical pr prints and dyes so and only with natural fibers yes so and the silk silk wool in the protein section yeah and in the cellulose or plant-based it's cotton linen and rainy right yeah we are often don't think of, of it in that structural form, mm. like wool being a protein and silk being a protein. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like dinner, you've got your protein, you've got your carbohydrates. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so do the proteins and the carbohydrates pick up the dye differently? Yes, they do. So um, fibres from animals are proteins, and so the silk and the wool are your proteins, and those fibres act like your hair or your fingernails. They have... Um, scales that open up in the water and so if there's any pigment or dye present the colour will go into the fibre. With um, bast fibres like linen, ramy, uh, cotton is not, it, cotton is just a plant fibre but they have a different structure and so the outside of the fibre is more like sticks and it's hard and you need usually a mordant or some kind of process to either attach the colour to the outside or to break that fibre, um, the external 
covering oh. to get the colour in. Because with dyeing, you're trying to get the colour into the fibre. Yeah. When you print, it's um, you, you create a substance, a substrate that will just sit over the top. So dyeing's quite different. Right. So the so the protein like the silk and the wool. Because they absorb the dye in, do they release it? The, with the carbohydrate fibres needing a, a fixer, that obviously fixes it for a longer time. Does the wool and the silk release dye? Okay, so getting the colour in is up to the fibre. How you get it in is up to the fibre. Whether it stays or not is up to the dye source. So, for example, there are five permanent dyes in the world. Indigo, madder, I'll, I won't be able to remember them all. <laughs> I think cochineal, maybe, f I'm not quite sure what the others are. I work mainly with substantive dyes. And, Which are? Uh, prints, um, leaves, eucalypt leaves, um, walnut, the husks, uh, oak, acorns. Um, there are others, but I can't remember what they are. And then there are what I call the fugitive dyes, and that's where the flowers come in. So normally what I'll do is, um, oh, onion skins, I think, are kind of between substantive and fugitive. They won't last your lifetime, but the colour is will stay for quite a long time. Right. Um, you can aid that colour fastness with your mordants. Right, because that is an incredible colour. Mm, it is. From, from a brown onion. Yes. And it's wow. been modified with alum, so I've used alum with that to try and keep the colour in the wool, but I know that it'll be okay for my lifetime. Incredible, yeah. incredible. And you were saying that indigo is found worldwide. Every, is is mm, matter found worldwide? Pretty much. I mean, these are the ancient plants. I mean, natural dyeing is not... It's not magical or I mean it, it, I mean it, let me just just backtrack um, natural dyes have been around for eons it's how people colored their clothes before industrial processes were created and so the plants that give color are plants that will grow in the zones where people lived mm. and across the equator in the warm regions that's where all the indigos will grow and every continent has had an indigo history so in the Asia Pacific area, it's Indi it's uh, Pesicaria tinctora, which is um, a soft-leaved plant that looks a bit like basil, and that's Japanese indigo, knotweed. It has lots of different names. Right. The indigofera species is more from India, Africa, and I think South America. I'm I'm not sure about South America, but the process of getting colour from those plants is steeped in history and culture and um, yeah so matter would have been part of that as well and the the knowledge and understanding of how to grow the plant and how to extract the colour is, is a cultural process as well. It sounds um, it sounds a little bit like alchemy like in a cross between chemistry and botanical knowledge mm -hmm. and look some of the work that I've done with indigenous people in northern Australia tell me that their understanding of how plants grow, how the world operates, the constellations, it's all interconnected with who they are, who they are in the world, what their relationships are to land and culture. And it seems to be all separated for us into what we call alchemy and ma magic and um, chemistry. But for where these traditions, I suppose, have come from, there aren't those separations, it's just what you do if you want to have something that's coloured, then you have to go through this process. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so um, I think in some... I'm reading about indigo in Africa and I think that there are s lots and lots of taboos and spiritual practices that are steeped in particular cultures, but thankfully I'm released from, 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 <laughs> from a religious practice so I don't have to follow the rules. I can yeah. just, like most contemporary artists I pick and choose like a like a bower bird from all of the different practices about how I put my my works together. It reminds me of the um, that European period where only the only royalty and um, and, re and the religious 
could use purple as a colour, they were the only ones within society that were allowed to use that, that yeah. cultural constraint. Yeah, and that comes from it being such a rare commodity because it was from a mollusk and right. you have to kill the animal to get the colour. Yeah. Um, it's like cochineal, the little bugs, they die, uh, or they, in both ways, they have to die in order for us to have red food colouring. Yeah. And the cochineal die for garments, or well, what I use cochineal for. Um, in those days, those mollusks were hard to find and the process of um, extracting that colour from them was a special skill and it was associated with royal houses and things like that. And so, yeah, it became very exclusive. Yeah, for, for the elite. Yes. Yeah. Hey, should we have a look at, um, at your little test samples? And, sure. I've, just, I've just been on Barbara's wardrobe and spotted this, which is made from an old wool blanket. Mm. It is fantastic. That's and really upcycling. Yeah, and I love it because in Canberra, in my studio, it's sub-zero temperatures and I can work in this without having a bulky scarf because the warmth, the, this um, creates the warmth around your neck. Right, it's just got a little mm -hmm. elastic yeah. um, thread through it. That is so cute. Anyway, what, um, what I was wanting to have a look at was was helping myself to <laughs> Barbara's closet was this and um, well tell me about okay so the garden. where I live there are eucalypts that give beautiful color and you can see there's crisp leaf prints here and almost like a vine like um, print here so this is a print of eucalypts um, on merino wool and it's just been dipped very briefly into indigo afterwards to give it a background colour. And the colour contrast, you have real ochre mm. and then the indigo is beautiful. They really complement each other, don't they? Mm. Mm. And they've got that almost like relief yes. of, the, of where the um, leaf has imprinted into mm. the into the fabric so the process is a heat process so you roll it very tightly so the leaves are in contact with the fiber the, the fabric and then you cook it in hot water for an hour and leave it to sit wool has a memory a fiber memory so the pressing of the leaves and the the buds and things into the wool will leave a permanent memory right can you show us how you do it sure so over here Something I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, so this is something that will be familiar to your New Zealand people, is pahutakawa leaves on wool. And you can see I've placed the pahutakawa leaves here. I've then rolled it like, th folded it like that, and then I roll it around a very um, technical instrument, which is a, a tent pole, <laughs> cut up. <laughs> And then what I do is I use um, a thick cord that I can't get blisters on my hands from, and you pull it really tightly. Is that old tea shoot or what? Yeah, it's something that I think people knit with these days. Right. And then you just wind it round so it's very, very tight, and then tie it off, pop it in a pot like this for an hour, cook it, and then I just let it cool down and steep overnight. And then in the morning, you open it up and it's like Christmas. And you can, I, I, had, I had been here previously when I first met you in April, and so I knew that Pahutakawa leaves would print. And I just found these on the path in the botanic gardens and collected them and brought them home to give um, a test. And it was interesting when we were talking about this earlier, how um, you can see the indent of the spine and that the, the colours actually coming off the underside of the leaf and with the waxy top coat of that leaf that's not where it releases the dye that's correct yeah yeah amazing yeah all leaves all leaves behave a little bit differently i think oak leaves are similar but that would be because they've got a waxy side and a and an underside too so that's that's probably a characteristic of those leaves yeah but when you look at the leaf the <laughs> it's the top side that looks like it's more colorful it's 
brighter green and the underside is more muted but actually it's the underside that releases the, yeah. releases the colour. And you can see here, this is just um, leaves on wool mm. with no modifier, nothing, so it's gone straight. So this is the colour that comes from the leaves, which is bears no indication from the leaf what you're going to get. Whereas with flowers, it's a little bit different. If you see a red flower, you know that you're going to get pink, usually. Yeah. Yeah. And you can just squeeze it in your fingers and the, the liquor that comes out of the flower is likely to be what you'll get on fabric. Oh, right. The, um, you had these little samplers here. Mm. So these are some little diagnostic kits that I've brought with me. Um, silk, cotton, linen and wool. And this one was put into some uh, rosemary that I cooked and made a, a dye from. And this is bottle brush. And this tells, so if we put the wools up, so you can see the wool is what takes up most color. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh, I haven't got them in order. So then these are the silks. And then we have linen, and then we go into the cotton. And you can see that the linen and the cotton do resist quite a bit, although the... So is it harder to dye a cotton than it is to dye mm. a, a wool or a silk? Yeah. <clears throat> because oh, of they're the, the ones you were saying that yeah. they need a fixer to... Yeah, yeah. because of the uh, nature of the fibre, the wool will take up most colour brilliantly, um, and silk secondary. And then you use either a mordant or a soy prep to get um, the cellulose fibres to pick up colour. Right. That is so delicate. Mm. And, um, so what was this? That silk. That's silk. Oh, no, no. The, um, oh, this the is um, bottle brush. Oh, bottle brush. Because mm. that is so subtle and pretty. Mm. Almost a blush colour on that. Yeah. Beautiful. I think I'll be looking for some bottle brush given that the um the camellias, camellias aren't working, working on wool right <laughs> <laughs> this is the color i'm getting from pink camellias on wool and you can see it's yellow so i'm going to have to do a few more tests to see if i where i can get a nice pink from it's not the color that you'd expect to get from that pretty little flower yeah it was beautiful pale pink yeah yeah i have to say i'm not i'm not particularly fond of it so. no <laughs> Oh, I'm not allowed to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> colour, colour's completely emotional. Right. Don't you think? I think that we're drawn to certain colours and they do have that mood changing effect. Mm. Like if I'm not feeling bright and cheery, I will always choose to wear something brighter to kind of lift my spirits. Exactly. I do the same thing. Today I'm all in black because because you're fine. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've seen you too. <laughs> um, so if people want to follow you, oh, how yes. do they follow you on Instagram? Yes, on Instagram, it's my label. Uh, it's a little bit tricky though. It's every underscore thread underscore counts underscore. And that all that, my website is um, everythreadcounts.design. Great. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you.